All right, I'm just going to pick up what Gabby said regarding fasting. So there is this course that starts on the 18th, 9.15, for four weeks. And on the 14th, the Wednesday before, we starting as we normally do, the 40-day fast. And you'll get notes for that when we, uh, next, from next week, you'll get the notes for that. So encourage you to be part of that fasting, the practice of fasting. And then I also want to uh, talk about prayer in the park. Wednesday at 1 p.m. And we are honored to, and I shouldn't be pointing out people, but we are honored to have Jim and Donna here who have come. And he is so faithful every week to go to the, to go to the, the park and pray with Cindy, of course. And Jim, you need to know every Friday I look forward to your drawings. They are amazing. I love them. He, he's an, he was or well, is an architect, and he draws these wonderful pictures every week. And so I always look forward to that. So that's a shout-out for Prayer in the Park on Wednesdays at 1 p.m. encourage you to be part of that if you can. Amen? Amen. And then uh, for those who are online, uh, just want to remind you that it's the first Sunday of the month, and we will have communion at the end of the message. And I do want to shout out to some people. There's a, a precious couple in their family from South Africa, Billy and Marty, who watch faithfully every Sunday evening. I send the outline to them. And then there's Tom, a wonderful uh, old Chinese man from San Francisco area who watches as well. So Thank you for being so faithful and joining us each and every week. And now, before we get into the message, I would love Cindy to come up for a moment. And Cindy has a testimony. Each week, we, we want to do a testimony regarding miracles. Last week, we had Amy, and she would have fitted better with this week on the healing of the blind but I knew she wouldn't be here because of her knee, so Cindy, you're it. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, the, the story that I want to tell happened a few years ago, but Carl and I have two children, a son who lives in Kirkland and a daughter whose name is Gabriel, and her husband's name is Gabriel, and they were married here in this church by Peter O. 12, 14 years ago. But anyway, for quite a few years, they lived in Paris. And one weekend, uh, Gabrielle, our daughter, was taking care of three children, their pastor's children, while the pastor and his wife were out of town. And her husband was on the train on his way to a conference in Switzerland. And um, he texted her, oh, maybe five o'clock, six o'clock, that he was having some pain in his chest. And so she texted us and said, Mom and Dad, could you pray for Gabby? He's not feeling very good, and he's on the train. So we said, sure. So she went on through the evening, got these little children into bed and all of that. And we texted later and said, how's Gabby doing? Well, he texted again, and the pain is getting worse. So we prayed some more, and she said, I don't know what to do, Mom. I can't leave. Um, I have to take care of these kids. What are... What, what should we do? And I said, well, Daddy and I will keep praying. You just relax and go to sleep. You know, there's a nine-hour time difference between Europe and Seattle or Bellevue. So anyway, Carl and I are praying away, and um, I text her, and it's about midnight in, well, no, later than that, in Paris. And I said, how is Gabby doing? And she said, well, I haven't heard from him. So, of course, we're frantic because what can we do what can she do, and what do we do about our son-in-law? So we prayed some more, and um, then being the helpful wife that I am to Carl, I said, <laughs> honey, you know, he's on his way to Switzerland. Weren't you born in Switzerland? Well, yeah, I was born in Switzerland. And I said, well, he's on his way to Montreux, which is in Switzerland. And didn't you used to work there? Well, yeah, I used to work there. And I said, well, then we have to get on the phone, and we have to find him. So Carl said, yeah, like, how's that going to work? And that was enough years ago when um, you used Skype to call um, overseas. 
So we got Skype on and we searched online for hospitals in Montreux. So we found one, and so Carl is on the phone calling Skype to this hospital. Well, he reaches this particular clinic, and it's a private hospital. So they, you know how the Swiss, they really like their privacy. So he, they, they made in no uncertain terms, we, we would not be able to help you, we would not even be able to identify if that particular individual was here. So Carl explained the situation and said he was on the train and he must have gone to some sort of an emergency room. Where would he be? So the lady said, oh, I can help you with that and gave him the name of a hospital and a phone number. So Carl, uh, we hang up, we call this next place and I said to Carl, this time just ask to go to the emergency room. Don't ask if he's there. So Carl, they, the operator answers, and Carl says, um, yes, could I be connected to the emergency room? Well, sure, they connected you, connected him to the emergency room. So then uh, Carl said, this is Carl Hutter or whatever, I'm looking for Gabriel Huey, is he there? And the um, attendant said, well, yes, he is. Would you like to speak to him? <laughs> So I'm madly texting Gabrielle, Daddy found him, Daddy found him. So uh, the phone gets transferred to Gabby, and Carl says to Gabby, Gabby, this is Carl. And there's kind of a silence, and then Gabby says, how did you find me? I don't even know where I am. Hmm. And... What a miracle. I mean, of course, I'm sobbing. Gabrielle's sobbing even though she's 8,000 miles away. And basically, the long and short of it was that he had to go by emergency to this hospital because he was having so much pain, and his cell phone went dead, and he was never able to charge it to stay in touch. But also, the good part of the story is that um, he didn't have a big heart problem at all. The doctors were able to figure it out, and he actually was able to, his attend to attend his conference for the weekend. So anyway, even though it's years ago, it's such a beautiful story about God meets us wherever our needs might be and takes care of us even in ways that we could never dream of. Amen. Amen. So I have a verse from John 14:12. Now, this is Jesus talking, and he says, In solemn truth, I tell you, anyone believing in me shall do the same miracles I have done, and even greater ones. You can ask the Father for anything using my name, and I will do it, for this will bring praise to the Father. So that's the promise he has for all of us. Amen. Thank you, Cindy. Well, if anybody has a testimony for next week, let me know. You got one, Don? Good. Don's up next week. We're going to talk about opposites this morning. As you know, we started a series on miracles. Last week, we looked at turning water into wine. And you need to know that I'm not going to go chronologically through the Bible and all the 40 odd, 41 miracles that there are. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 9 from verse 27 and onwards. Two astounding miracles, two opposite reactions to those miracles. You know, when God said, let there be light, he was saying, in effect, I want to display myself and I want to put my glory on display. Part of that was creating humans, people like you and I who have eyes and vision and the ability to receive and take in what God has made. You know, as you look at me right now, your mind is going, the, your eyes are making billions of calculations and adjustments every second. An astounding amount of information is flowing into your mind through your eyes. And I think uh, on my way home, when I, when I drive home, sometimes there are eagles uh, soaring over Lake Washington, five, six, seven hundred feet above, and it's absolutely amazing to watch these magnificent birds just using the thermals as they go around. And I think about 
my brain processing everything that I see there. Not only the, the landscape, but these beautiful birds there. And you know, maybe I have a problem. I'm going to ask God about it one day. But they have such a pathetic cry, eagles, don't they? <laughs> There's nothing really magnificent about those, that cry of an eagle. But that's me. Science tells us that all of those different aspects of vision are handled in different parts of the brain. Yet we only see one image, that eagle flying overhead. That's an incredible, that's how incredible our eyesight is. We depend on our eyesight for so much, don't we? And for that reason, vision, the idea of vision, saturates our language. Scripture especially the Old Testament, is filled with that word you see on the screen, behold. And in Hebrew, it's hinai. Behold, something happened. It means look at the experience and take it in. A poll was done recently where they asked Americans about blindness. And that was the one uh, disability, more than anything else, that people were fearful of. Think about what your world would be like if you were totally blind. Quarter of us, statistically, would have myopia. And that means our lens focuses about one millimeter in front of our retina. So we need lenses to adjust. I think blind people, therefore, as perhaps the most courageous people that there are around. In the text, we meet two courageous blind people who would not be stopped and would keep calling out after and pursuing Jesus to get what they need. need. Medical knowledge has made incredible strides with the eyes, but no one can do what Jesus did. He has the power to heal blindness. We also have another miracle in our text, which is the healing of the man who is mute. In Matthew's gospel, Matthew step by step unfolds the credentials of Jesus Christ to be king of the kingdom of heaven. And we spoke about that a number of weeks ago. We looked at the four gospels and the aspects of Jesus that were revealed to us. And right from the beginning of this gospel of Matthew, we have his genealogy as he lays out the evidence of proof that Jesus is the descendant of David and Abraham and that he is Messiah. And we're going to see the term son of David from the scriptures that we're going to be dealing with this morning. We have evidence that he wasn't only the son of David, but he is the son of God. He was God in the flesh. And so looking at Matthew chapter 9, verse 27, as Jesus went from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. Statistics from the World Health Organization tell us that there are about more than 2.2 billion people in the world who are blind. 2.2 billion. And the majority of them are in the emerging world, in the third world. Most of them, as I said, are in the third world. And their blindness is caused by unsanitary conditions, infectious organisms, blowing sand, accidents, war, malnutrition, excessive heat, and bright sunlight. Can you imagine that amount of people around the world, out of 8 billion people? Nowadays, certain conditions can be cured, but there are so many forms of blindness that are not able to be cured. These two beggars were friends. They were companions in darkness. These beggars cried out to Jesus, Son, uh, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. We see that term, son of David, again in uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 46. And it says, as Jesus came to Jericho and his disciples were leaving the city, a blind man named Bartimaeus was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard of Jesus of Nazareth was going by, he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David. Have mercy on him. Now, think about it. Where did these guys find out about what or how to address Jesus? We see that there's an unrelenting 
persistence for mercy. So what is mercy? It means getting something from God that you know you don't deserve. Getting something from God that you know you don't deserve. I think grace means not getting from God the things you deserve, namely wrath and judgment. These two men came to Jesus not only with the right understanding of his great worthiness, but also their great unworthiness. And that is the attitude of the heart that the Lord honors and accepts. Jesus was the most powerful, most merciful human ever to have lived. He reached out to the sick and healed them. He reached out to the cripples and gave them legs to walk. He healed the eyes of the blind and the ears of the deaf and the mouth of the dumb. Prostitutes and tax collectors were drawn into his circle of his love. He took the lonely and made them feel loved. He took the little children and gathered them into his arms. He showed mercy to all. But you can't demand mercy. So these blind beggars were crying out for mercy. They had an uncommon faith because they called Jesus son of David, the messianic title from the Old Testament. One of the things we must recognize about these beggars is that any information they had about Christ must have come through their hearing. The Bible tells us faith comes by hearing. The blind beggars represent you and I. Do you believe the way that the blind beggars believed. Faith comes by hearing. Jesus is going to test their faith though. And as he walks by, they cry out, have mercy on us, son of David. He doesn't say a word. He just keeps on walking. They follow him continually crying out, the Greek says, after him. They were following him continually crying out, son of David, have mercy on us. They were relentless as they were following him. But he doesn't say a thing. He goes into a house. And so the question is, is he callous and unfeeling? And they, they believe that he was going into Peter's home. So is he callous and unfeeling? No. He's testing their faith. And when they come into the house where Jesus was staying, he looked at them and he, he said to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? Do you believe that I'm able to do this? It speaks of a belief in Christ. And because that, he can do all things. He asks him, do you believe that I'm able to do this thing? And what he was wanting from them was for them to speak their faith out. He wanted them to speak out their faith and say, yes, Lord, they answer. And that's a lesson for you and I, I believe. God wants us also to speak out our faith. Have you ever felt like uh, this in prayer? You're crying out to him, Lord, son of David, have mercy. And it seems like your prayers just hit the ceiling. It seems like he walks right by and doesn't seem to answer. Folks, we need to be persistent in our faith. And so they come into this house and Jesus tests them further. Verse 29. He touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, will it be done to you? Jesus was in the world, incarnate, physical, that he might touch people. He would lay hands on people and heal them. He needn't have done that. He needn't have done that. All he had to do was speak and it would have been done. But he reaches out and he touches the blind eyes and says, according to your faith, be it done unto you. And let me tell you this, folks. That's part of the injunction that you and I have. We need to reach out to people and touch them in the name of the Lord. Amen? Thank you for that one or two amens. The rest, he touches their blind eyes and says, according to your faith, Will it be done? And, you know, this outstanding miracle, I believe, is totally unique to Jesus. There's no record in the Old Testament of the healing of a blind man. Moses performed incredible miracles to show the power of God. 
Elijah and Elisha saw people raised from the dead. The messianic prophecies of Isaiah are absolutely clear. Let me read a few of them. Isaiah 29 and 18. In that day, the deaf will hear the words of the scroll, and out of the gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. Isaiah 35, verse 5 and 6. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue will shout for joy. Water will flow or gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Isaiah 42, verse 6 and 7. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. That is God speaking about Christ. I will take Hold of your hand, I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and the light for the Gentiles. To open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Messianic prophecies for you and I. When Jesus began his ministry in Nazareth, he got up in the synagogue and he read from the scroll of Isaiah. And he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives. And listen, and recovery of sight to the blind. To release the oppressed and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendants and sat down and said, Today, in your hearing, the scripture is fulfilled. Remember, Jesus told the blind man, according to your faith, will it be done unto you? And I thought about this all week long, thinking about this whole process that happened with these two blind men. And I, and I think this is interesting, because I think there's a direct correlation between faith and eyesight. Let me explain. Both are passive. They see something, receive it, and take it in. And so in faith, we take in what God is doing. By faith, we receive. By faith, we are justified. By faith, we are forgiven. And by faith, according to our faith, will it be done to you. Somebody once wrote this. He said, the faith, which in itself is nothing, is yet the organ for receiving everything. The faith which in itself is nothing, yet the organ for receiving everything. It is the conducting link between man's emptiness and God's fullness. They had faith for healing, but they didn't have faith for obedience. Let me explain. Verses 30 and 31, Jesus warned them sternly, see that no one knows about this, but they spread the news about him all over the region. I think it's far easier to believe for salvation than it is to obey constantly. And maybe, you know, I put myself in the position of those two guys. Finally, they see. I don't know. I'd be out there in the street shouting it out. doesn't matter what Jesus said. Maybe I'm just a disobedient disciple, but there we are. But think about it. So he told them not to go and tell anybody. It's harder for us to obey the commandments of Jesus Christ day by day, moment by moment, than it is to trust him for salvation. They disobeyed him. There was nothing complicated in what he told them. Don't go and tell anyone about this. You might say, with Jesus, why is this miracle not being published abroad for everyone? But you see, he is our Lord. And he is our king. And so we should be obedient in every instance to whatever he might say. We can only speculate as to his reasoning for saying that. And so he has the question. Do we need to understand in order to obey? No. I think we nearly, merely understand the commandment and then obey there's so many things in Scripture that I do not understand. But yet, as his disciple, you and I as, as his disciples, we are called to obey. 
Obedience is better than sacrifice. Now, let's look at the next miracle, the healing of the mute in verse 32 and 33. While they were going out, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And when the, demons, the demon was driven out, the man who'd been mute spoke. This demon controlled this man so much that he had lost his ability to speak. Christostom said this, The affliction was not natural, but the device of an evil spirit. For this cause, Jesus doesn't require the mute, mute faith, but sets him free straight away. So Jesus doesn't ask him for anything. He just drives out the demon. This man was destitute, and he was without hope. But a simple command from Christ, and the demon was gone. And here is where it gets interesting. The text doesn't tell us. The power of the demon over the tongue was broken. But the power of the heart over the tongue was not broken and never will be. Let me explain what I'm saying. Because Luke 6 and 45 says this. Out of the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. James puts it this way. He says, we all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and tamed by a man. But no man, listen to this, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. I know this. Jesus warns us that how we are to use the tongue. And you know, the tongue will give us ample evidence of eternal destiny, whether heaven or hell. No man can tame the tongue. Matthew 12 says this, You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good man will bring good things out of the good stored up in him. You just have to stop for a moment and listen to the way people speak and you'll know what their hearts are like. I don't know about you, but I've been around people, man, every second or third word is a cuss word. You know what is in their hearts when they speak like that. When you go around, you get around some people, you think about it. All they can do is pull other people down. All they can do is speak ill of whatever situation, whatever things going on around the world, whatever's going on in, the, in their families. All they can do is speak evil. You know what is in their hearts. And yet, and maybe I'm judging, but I'm going to say this, maybe they're not really Christians. Good man will bring good things out of a, the good stored up in him. The evil man will bring evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you'll be acquitted and by and by you, you will be condemned. So, simple question. How do we use our tongue? When you're around somebody, is your first thought how troubling they are, how bad they are, how they do this, they do that, they do the next thing? Or is there something in you that wants to praise them wants to build them up, wants to speak life over them. You don't have a demon controlling your tongue, but you have a heart that controls your tongue. What does your tongue show about your heart? And that's a question for each one of us. And it's time, maybe it's, we need to just pause for a moment right here and think about your conversations with your spouse. Think about what's happened in your life in this last week, your interaction with other people. 
What has that been like? Now, I know there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. But we who are Christ followers need to follow Scripture. So the differing reactions to healing. At this point, we have an assessment of Christ. Amazed and open versus angry and opposing. In verse 33 and 34, the crowd were amazed and said, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. And then you have the opposite. The Pharisees said, it is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. You know, worldwide today, and even in our own country, Christ is in the dock, on trial right now. Just like Pilate, who was in the judgment seat, with Jesus standing before him, so Christ is in the dock. It doesn't change who he is. He is God, and it doesn't change the reality about him. But we, all of us, assess and are weighing. The evidence was the same. The reaction was very different. On one hand, some people were amazed and open about it. Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. They must have thought about Moses and Elijah and Elisha and Daniel. And there never was anything like that in their lives. They were ready to believe in Christ. And then we had these others. And isn't it interesting? It was the religious group. The ones that maybe felt threatened. They were angry and opposed and skeptical and didn't believe. Just like many people today. I don't know why they felt that way, but they were set against him forever. Wherever Jesus ministers, there is always a division into believers and other believers. Jesus said this, do you think I came to bring peace on the earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, Mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And so, don't we see that in our own families? I know in my own family, I have that. For many years, as you know, we've been Christians, and yet, two of my brothers don't want to know anything about Christ. And all I can do is pray for them. John chapter 10, 19 says, The Jews were again divided. Many of them said, He's demon-possessed and raving mad. They ascribed to Jesus the power of the enemy. And the same that we saw in this text. But others were saying, No, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a man possessed by a demon... Open the eyes of the blind. There's division. And there'll always be division, even on judgment day. There'll be the wheat and the chaff between the sheep and the goats. The issue is always the same. Just as it was when the bronze serpent was lifted up. Bronze serpent was lifted up in the desert. And all of Israel was divided into two categories. Believer and unbeliever. So will it be. In the end of the world. And so, what is the application we can take from these miraculous stories? First of all, the astounding power of Jesus Christ. And let me tell you this. That power has never diminished. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He creates, he heals, and he's all-powerful. When you look at Jesus, what do you see? 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and 4 says, The God of this age, Satan, has blinded the eyes of the world so they cannot see Christ for who he really is. When you look at Jesus, what do you see? Do you see a Savior? Do you see him on a cross dying for you, shedding his blood so that you might have eternal life? Do you see him risen from the dead? Or do you see something else? 
And secondly, what do you say? Can you speak a word of confession that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Now, I believe that everybody in this room this morning has made that decision to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But here's the question. Dear ones, here's the question. What are we doing with that? What are we doing with that? And so I want to ask you another question in Matthew 16, 13 and onwards. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do men say I am? Who do men say I am? The Son of Man? So they said, some say you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said, but who? Now, yeah, he's being very pointed. But who do you say I am? You see, that's a personal question for each one of us. Yes, we might have walked the, altar, walked the, the aisles and come to the altar one day or wherever we accepted Jesus Christ and our Lord and Savior. But today, who do you say he is? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. You see, only God can reveal himself in this way to you and I. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or gates of hell, shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so, here's my question. Did that only apply to Peter? I don't believe so. I believe it applied to you and I as well. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is already loosed in heaven. That's the correct translation. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And so, I would submit to you for too long. We have gathered as Christ followers in our churches and our Bible studies and wherever we may have gone to have a theological discussion about what we believe. And the theory of our faith is no longer adequate to address the challenges of this generation. We're going to have to understand how we can cooperate with and participate in the power of God. We desperately in this nation and around the world need the Spirit of God to move amongst us. You know, so many of us gather with all the wonderful languages around our faith, the wonderful words and statements and positions that are biblically derived, but we actually have very little intent of experiencing God. Unacceptable. It's like giving a hungry person a cookbook or a picture of food and saying, get on with it. I know for a fact, and I say this without contradiction, I know for a fact that every one of you want to experience the power of God in your life. Not only for you, but for your family, for your community. And so, my friends, let's do this. Let us understand the authority, the power that has been delegated to you and I as believers. Amen. Here's what I'd like you to do. We're going to have communion in a moment, but here's what I'd like you to do. And we can prepare to hand out the communion elements. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to just open your hands like this, if you would. And I want you to just pray for a moment. 
I want you to just ask the Lord to reveal himself to you in a new way this week. I had a, maybe it's a revelation, I don't know what it is, but the other day I was just thinking about it. Been a Christian for so many years. But am I aware of Christ in my life on a daily basis? When I drive the car and somebody cuts me off. Remember that old bracelet that we used to have? What would Jesus do? I thought about it. Somebody was driving like an absolute in front of me. <laughs> Got to watch the words of my mouth. I've just spoken about it. But what did I do? Fortunately, I prayed for him because he was driving like a... Because he was an accident waiting for a place to happen. Are we aware 24-7 of God with us. So Father in Jesus name. I thank you for these precious people. Thank you Lord that as we look at these miracles. They are not words. Just words. On, in a book. On a piece of paper. But Father. You've said. And Cindy quoted it earlier. The things that I do, can you do also and greater. And so Lord, help us in our unbelief. Help us to understand what that really means. Help us to be aware of you on an ongoing daily basis, 24-7. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen.